Good morning. It is good to see you here this morning. It's great to come out and be together. So we come and worship together. Please come in and find a spot. Join us in the auditorium. Those of you that are streaming, we're glad that you can participate with us virtually as we all come together and worship together and encourage each other this morning by reminding ourselves and each other that we can't do this alone. We need each other and we need God. Let's all stand together and sing. I need Thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like Thine can peace afford. I need Thee, oh I need Thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour, stay Thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when Thou I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. I need thee every hour, most holy. This is my song. 
song, my humble plea. I am your child, I am indeed. I am your child, I am in need. Please be seated. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you so much uh, for being such a loving Father. Uh, Father, for giving us this place that we can come worship, um, a safe place we can come and uh, refill our spirits uh, with, with the love from the people around us, Father. Uh, that is uh, uh, such, a, such a blessing. Father, you've created such a, a beautiful story all the way from creation until now, and uh, we realize that we are part of this story. Uh, Father, so uh, please uh, uh, be with us as we, we learn from your word today, and be with us as we try to spread your story uh, and uh, have faith in, uh, in the things that, uh, that we're supposed to do, and uh, to spread your kingdom, Father. Um, please be with all that are are sick and uh, uh, need extra healing and comfort. Um, Thank you, Father, and uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll be observing communion together in just a moment. If you did not um, have your emblems with you, if you'll raise your hand while we sing, we'll pass those out to you. My only hope is you, Jesus, my only hope is you. From early in the morning till late at night, my only hope is you. From early in the morning till late at night, my only hope away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Good morning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we read that a lot when we do the Lord's Supper. Um, Brother Paul tells us about the Lord's Supper and, and how it happened and what Jesus said during that time. But many times we stop right there um, in verse 26. He says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. But then He follows up. And He said, Therefore, whoever eats the, br- the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in doing so, 
He is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And it got me thinking about how we examine ourselves before we partake the Lord's Supper. And what, what is a worthy manner that we do, that we partake of the Lord's Supper? And that's a deep subject, I know. But I started reading um, in the Gospels all the accounts about the Lord's Supper. And one of them struck me just before the Lord's Supper when Jesus was teaching his apostles. Uh, one of his main things, he said, they'll know that you're my disciples by the way you love one another. And I started thinking, so many churches, so many of our churches, and I, I'm not, I mean worldwide, there'll be people sitting on this side and people sitting on this side that can't get along with the one sitting on this side. And for us to partake of the Lord's Supper, um, when we have feelings against our brothers and sisters, I, I would imagine that falls in that unworthy category. But then Jesus did something else. In, in John, it said, um, chapter 13, verse 5, I think this was Jesus teaching how to be worthy. He said, Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel in which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter, and Simon Peter said, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said, What I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand later. And Peter said, You'll never wash my feet. And Jesus rebuked him and said, If I don't wash your feet, you don't belong to me. Jesus was giving us an example. Uh, washing feet was done by servants, not by what they considered equals at the time. Washing feet was becoming humble and serving others. And how do we prepare for the Lord's Supper on Sunday? I think he gave us that example. And in class last week, um, we were talking about in James chapter 1 at the end of it, he says, true religion is this, taking care of the widows and orphans. What we sometimes consider religion is going through some of the acts that we do here today. But in, in essence, I believe what true religion is, is us serving, serving people outside, loving one another, and serving our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how we prepare to be worthy to take the Lord's Supper every Sunday. So it's not just a, can we get our mind right when we come in here? It's how we're living every day. Are we taking on that servant's role? Are we trying to act more like our master did and be willing to wash people's feet that we would not consider our equal? So as we prepare for the Lord's Supper today, let's think about how we can serve our brothers and sisters in Christ whether it be here, out in the community, in foreign lands, or wherever. But being a servant, I think, is what God has been trying to teach us all along, is serving one another and loving one another. So the more we do that, and none of us are perfect. I mean, Peter was sitting there saying, you're not going to wash my feet. And once he understood, he said, well, then uh, Jesus washed my whole body. You know, he finally, I think it finally got through Peter's thick skull what Jesus had been trying to teach the whole time. And that was, let's all try to become more servants as we go through this week. Let's bow together. Father God, we thank you so much uh, that you thought so much of us, that you planned for our eternal destiny before man was even created. Father, that you loved us enough that you sent your son, Jesus. And he sent us and came here, Father, and, and lived and died for us. And that he was willing to do that. That he was willing to humble himself and lay down his life for us. We thank you for that body that was so beaten, Father. Thank you as we think of that today. 
Help us, Father, to be more servant-like like he was. In Jesus' name, amen. bow again. Father, we thank you for that beautiful, precious blood that was shed for us. Father, we know we can never do enough works in this life to be acceptable. We know we can never work our way to heaven. And it's truly by this blood that we're given the grace that covers all of our sins. Thank you for that blood that was given for us. Thank you that it covers a multitude of sins and continues to cover those, Father. Help us, Father, to strive to live more like your Son every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. morning. That's pretty weak, wasn't it, Dean? Good morning. morning. There we go, much better. Good to see everybody. Hope everybody uh, had a good week. Uh, Looking forward to a good week this week. Uh, It's good to be back with you. I really appreciate Nikki filling in last week on short notice. Uh, I get a cold about once every couple of years that just lasts for seven or eight days. It's, you know, probably some of you get those too, and uh, it's just not a very pleasant time, but I'm better now. Congestion's pretty much gone, and that's a good thing. So, uh, it is also comforting to know that people do still get colds, just so you know. There is still a common cold out there, and you can just get a cold, and and it just sort of has to run its course like it used to. And people ask, uh, well, what are you taking? Same thing I took 20 years ago, Dake 1 NyQuil. It seems to work still, you know. (laughs) All right. Just want to mention a few people. It's good to see Jim. I think I saw Jim. Yep, good to see Jim. Surgery went well Monday, I guess, right? Another one coming up soon. Tomorrow. That's pretty soon. Yeah. All right. So keep Jim in your prayers. And then uh, also Linda with the passing of her brother. And uh, just a, so tough week for the Stanleys and we want to uh, continue to encourage them. We keep Linda Chandler in front of you and just her family uh, as she continues to rehabilitate. We mentioned Paul every week and uh, been some significant updates this week. Paul, uh, they, they thought maybe the cancer had gotten into his brain. They were concerned about that. He was fairly dysfunctional, but uh, got to the hospital and realized he was really just dehydrated. He's got other issues going on, but really the dehydration was his biggest problem. And they did a scan. The cancer was not in his brain, so that's good. And he's feeling better. And uh, just having his body hydrated again, that's very helpful. But still, he's got a lot to go through as well as Anne, his wife. And then Ashley uh, mentioned that a few times, uh, their daughter who uh, has six children, I think six children, and uh, she's got a court case coming up the end of February that they're anxious about. So just a lot of things going on in their family. Daniel Allen uh, still recovering. There's just so many. I look at Greg Mitchell back there, and we, we got a, just a lot of folks that uh, it's a tough season. And we want to keep them all in our prayers. There are some good things happening around. Gabriel Tannehill was born uh, January 29th, I think it was. I forgot that date right, but congratulations. Uh, We've got Valentine's Day coming up. And uh, Faye Thompson is probably a good contact. Or Ann could give you more information uh, about making some cupcakes and uh, doing some stuff for... Uh, Some of our older folks, especially some of the shut-ins, an opportunity to get out and encourage them. This is something you can help with, your kids can help with. There's a lot of great opportunity there. So look in the bulletin or talk to one of them. Tomorrow night at uh, Terra Nova's, we're having our Valentine's dinner that we we share every year. You can still sign up out front. There's also an option if you want to just order something and go pick it up and take it home. That option's available to you also. Again, information in the bulletin for that. And we would love for you to uh, be a part of that evening tomorrow night. Obviously, as every year, 
Uh, we're very thankful Terranovas donates the food, but we ask people to make contributions and everything that is contributed goes to our mission fund. And uh, that's a good thing. As far as missions, we do have uh, an opportunity coming up with February the 13th. This is where we ask you to make a commitment for the year, either give money on that day for missions for the year or make a commitment of money that you'll give throughout the year. So our missions group has uh, an idea of what kind of money they have to operate with. For any of you that are new, uh, just mention this briefly that the way we do our budget is you can give to our general fund. Well, you, you can actually specify a variety of things, but one thing that's important is money that's given to missions goes to missions and only missions. And so that's when we separate it. We have that one Sunday. Again, you can give throughout the year and designate it to missions, but everything that you give goes for that, uh, the variety of things that we do in mission work. And there'll be more said about that uh, in the next couple of weeks, uh, or I guess... Uh, Brian, I think next week we'll talk a little bit more specifically about some of the things that take place, but you can see there the, the variety of places where that money is given. Also, a Baja mission trip coming up in June, I think it's June 18th through 23rd, are the dates of that. Mike Gunnels can give you more information. The main thing right now is there's very limited space in Baja for people to stay that are visiting, so we need to have an idea of who is interested in going. Not that you have to make a commitment today, but just a general idea of who's going so we can be making arrangements and looking forward to that trip. I think I read eighth grade and up is welcome, so uh, a great time maybe for families to go, but if you have any interest in participating in that, see Mike. And finally, we do have lunch today, all right? Uh, poppy seed chicken with rice. I believe it is, and some uh, broccoli salad and some kind of brown dessert. I don't know what it was, but there's just a lot of pudding and junk in there that's, uh, I won't say junk, but y'all you know, know what I mean. A lot of that stuff that goes right here and just stays. There's a big old pan of it if you're interested in that. So stay and uh, have fun with us for lunch. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for our time together. We thank you for the chance just to enjoy each other's fellowship Father, to think about you, to look into your word. Just bless our time together this morning. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. It's time for our children's classes. We have classes starting in the nursery all the way up through eighth grade. So we'll dismiss them and their teachers. And the rest of us, let's stand and continue to worship in song together. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart, Lord, I need you, oh, I
So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. again. I did mention, mean to mention something a minute ago when I was up here, and it, I, I just didn't, but it's Andrea Dennis back there. Wave to everybody, Andrea. Uh, if you are on social media at all, you have probably noticed several postings uh, about Monroe, and just a variety of things going on, and I really appreciate that. It is really neat to see, and Andrea is doing a wonderful job. She just took that on, that uh, she wanted to try to help get more word out about things that are going on, and I know Ann works with Andrea, and they, they work together, and there's just... Uh, I think there's really good communication going on right now with opportunities. If you look at things or stay engaged or interested in participating, it, it really gives you a chance to do that. All right, we're in the story, and uh, you know, we started a couple of weeks ago in Chapter 1, and then last week I was out, and Nikki, uh, I listened to Nikki's uh, lesson. I almost sent him an email and told him that I didn't really like the way he preached, but that... that uh, that would have taken effort on my part, so I didn't, didn't take the time to... For those of you that don't know the history, he sent me an email that said that, so I thought it was just a good opportunity for me to pay him back, but I didn't get to do that. Uh, I did enjoy the way he went through it, and it, it was excellent, taking you know from Adam and Eve to the flood in Noah, and so we're in chapter 2, but as we will probably do as we go through the story. I, I pulled out and I read chapter two and was refreshed with it and ready to go. And I thought, well, you just, we can't, you just can't do that. And, uh, you know, just general uh, history. All right. And, and Nikki went through this, you know, it depends on how you view it, but we're going to say that there's probably, you know, the, the world's somewhere around 6,000 years old. All right. Just we'll throw that out there as maybe just an estimate. All right. And that, so if we trace it back, that's 2,000, you know, a little over 2,000 years now since Christ. Right. And we can trace pretty easy back to Abraham. Abraham was born around 2100 BC, somewhere in there. So uh, now we've got about 4,000 years of history. Right. And if you take the seven-day literal creation, 24-hour period, seven days, from the time of uh, you know, God beginning this earth up to the flood, about how many years was that? Y'all, Nikki, you'll have to do it again. I don't guess they listened last week. So what about it? About how many years? Tell them, Nikki. Do what now? Six of it from the, from, the, from the beginning of earth up to the flood. Okay, somewhere in there. All right. And then, so while we're here, thank you, Mickey. Uh, while we're here and going to have to do this today, is from the flood until Abraham, about how many years is there? Anybody got a guess? Around 1,000 years or so. All right. So, and my point is, I didn't see any way to go from Genesis 9 to Genesis 12, and skip chapter 10 and 11, which is a thousand years, we're, again, we're estimating, but, but around a thousand years of human history. And it's incredible that that is all contained right there in two chapters that are not even that long, two chapters of the Bible. You have 1,000, around 1,000 years of human history that is really important, all right? So I'm going to go ahead and give you your assignment for next week. 
We won't get into this much next week, but in your time between now and next week, I would like for you, and this, this is really foundational for us to understand when we get to Abraham. The reason we're doing this is I think it's very important for us to set the world stage. What is going on in our world? What's happening at the time Abraham was called by God. I tend to think that we, in our minds, when we read the story, we think about the flood, we think about the Tower of Babel, and then Abraham. So we picture, you know, I don't know, there's two, three hundred people running around on the world, and, you know, Abraham's one of them, God calls them out. It's real important for us to get an idea what took place from the flood until Abraham, again, to give us some context of what it was in the world that God calls Abraham into. So your assignment for next week, and I'll have some pictures, I want you to go and look at world history and see some of the things that happened, see some of the things that were built, see some of the civilizations that rose and fell during the time from the flood to Abraham, all right? You get it? Just go look, and we'll have some pictures, and we'll just briefly try to draw a picture next week of sort of what the world looked like that Abraham was called into. But we're going to spend a little bit of time this morning uh, talking about that. Do you know if you want to hear God speak, read your Bible. If you want to hear God speak audibly, read your Bible out loud. If you were to read your Bible out loud in a pulpit speed, what they call a pulpit speed, that's a, a, you know, like you listen to Bible or you listen to reading in books on tape or something driving down the road. If you were to go from Genesis to Revelation listening or just reading it out loud, that would take you about 71, 72 hours. All right? That'd be about 12 minutes a day if you wanted to do it in a year's time. And you could start at Genesis 1, and hopefully as you've been reading the story, you're reading the Bible also. And like we said, you know, this part of it, all of it really is in Genesis. You don't have to go other places to figure out what's going on. You would be just reading along just fine until you got to Genesis chapter 10. And when you got to Genesis chapter 10, where we are today, it was, your reading would slow down considerably because it's just a list of a whole bunch of names. And by the way, if you are... Thinking of having children, or maybe you have some of your children that are pregnant and they're looking for Bible names, <coughs> excuse me, Genesis 10 is not the place to go, all right? Just not a good place. All right, maybe you do like it. You could always go with our fox ad and just call him Arfi for short. I always like the name Peleg. Nobody, I'd. how about Amadad? You could just call him Almo. Y'all aren't liking the Nimrod, and we'll see in a few minutes why you really would never want to call your child Nimrod or Magog. How's that? Nobody ever goes for those names, right? Anyway, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit through Genesis 10 and 11, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of those names, but really about what God is doing, and we'll make a point at the end of why we're doing this and why it's very important, all right? You could look at the book of Genesis and think of it this way, and it is. It is a book of beginnings, right? It is. We read the beginning of the universe, the beginning of earth, see the beginning of mankind, the beginning of marriage, beginning of family, beginning of Sabbath, see first sacrifice, you even see the beginning of the gospel being preached when Adam and Eve have sinned and God talks about the curse, but he also talks about what? The blessing. In Genesis 9, we see first human government. So the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings, but I want us to think of it more in uh, this way, as a book of blessings. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 1, then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, what? Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. And that's what we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at today, is this filling of the earth that God put this responsibility on people after the flood, Noah and his children, and he told them to go and fill the earth. And there are so many things that we're going to see as we go through the story that I just think are super neat about how God brings things together. You can go look at this, and we're going to talk through some of this, not in any great depth, but this is where Noah and his three sons as they went and filled the earth, this is where they ended up. They ended up in 70 nations. It's interesting when we think of Noah and his three sons, we always call them what? If you call them Noah's sons, say their names. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Interesting because that's in the opposite order 
of their chronological age. It's Japheth is the oldest, Ham is the middle, and Shem is the youngest. But we call them Shem, Ham, and Japheth because Shem is the one, and we're going to see that, we're going to start focus on, because that's through Shem that the blessing comes. But here's what's interesting. Shem, there, there's 70 nations that come out of Noah and his three sons. 70 nations. God says, go fill the world, multiply. 70 nations. Shem has 26 nations that come from his children. Ham has 30 nations that come from his. And Japheth has 14 nations that come through his for a total of 70. Get this. This is super neat now. God said, go fill the earth and multiply, and he did it through 70 nations. Do you remember over in the book of Luke when Jesus wanted to take the gospel into the world? How many did he send out? Remember, how many did he send out? Seventy. There's a neat story going on here, and that's what I want us to see this morning, in God telling them to fill the earth and 70 nations coming from this. There's purpose and intent here, just like there was when God, through Jesus, took the good news to all the world. He sent out 70. It is also interesting that <coughs> in <clears throat> Noah and his descendants through these three sons, you have, and we'll, get, we'll see, you, you have all the ethnicity, all the, not the beginning of all the languages, you, you just have all this diversity that our world became, and it starts here, and it goes through all his children. You know how many languages there are in the world today? Over 6,800 languages. That's incredible. And in many of those languages, there's so many dialects, like in India, there's so many dialects in the languages there that you may speak the same language, but you speak a different dialect. You can't even communicate with someone else that speaks the same language because your dialect is so different. And my point is, there are so many ways that people communicate with each other, and you know what? There's purpose to it. I said you could call Genesis the beginning, and we do see a lot of beginnings, but I think you could look at Genesis and think of it this way, as the blessings. Because Genesis and the story, and that's what I want us to see again, we're trying to understand the story. Genesis, as we just saw, there's a lot of beginnings that take place, but one of the main beginnings that takes place is the beginning of God explaining to us how he wants to bless us. How he wants to bless us. He starts with Adam and Eve, and he wants to be a blessing in our lives. And his story from Adam and Eve all the way through is continual effort to bless his creation. It's a beautiful way that he attempts to do that, and we're going to see one of those ways just today. All right, some of you are, I like preaching in Monrovia because we got people here that are even older than I am, and that's always really cool, right? Because most everywhere I go now, I'm the old guy. Uh, I, Tell you, like, I, at work, I remember when I first started in the FAA, I was 29, and I would see these, like, people come in from headquarters or something like that, and I think, man, good, they are so old. And now I know when I go places, that's what the people look at me and think, that guy is so old, well, you wonder why he wouldn't just quit or something. Anyway, all that to say this, you could think of the story we're talking about today as my three sons. I say that because some of you don't have any clue what my three sons is all about, Right? But there's some of you that are old enough, y'all remember actually watching My Three Sons. It was actually a pretty good show of a guy had three sons. He was, I think he was an aeronautical engineer, if I remember right. Fred McMurray played that role. Uh, it was really, a, you know, it was back in the old, good old days and, uh, you know, just real clean, sort of funny story. But My Three Sons, that is our topic for the next few minutes. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 1. This is the account of Shem. Ham and Japheth. Again, that's the opposite order. Noah's sons, who themselves had sons after the flood. Now, you got to go back to Genesis 9, 27. May God extend Japheth's territory. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be the slave of Japheth. Interesting, Japheth, his ancestry, or his, his descendants, of which, guess what? Many of you very likely came from Japheth. All of you either came from Shem, Ham, or Japheth. You can trace your 
ancestry back to there if you're capable of doing it. But many of you did, because this is sort of, and we're going to look in more detail, this is sort of where Japheth, his descendants ended up in a lot of Europe and in that area. They actually had a language called the Indo-European language. But this is what's interesting with Japheth. If you go look at Japheth and the descendants, they became very, very uncouth. They were, they were really just vulgar, and they had a lot of practices like sacrifice that, 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 that were just, uh, I mean, they, they were very, very rough people until there came a time in Japheth's descendants, a very specific time of when they adopted the god of Shem into their culture, and then they drastically changed what kind of people they were. They ended up, again, in a lot of what's Europe, in the United States, a variety of other places. These are the sons of Japheth that we're going to look at in just a minute. Gomer, first one mentioned, the Cimmerians, Cimmerians in Asia Minor. I mean, we're going to go through a lot of this in don't, you don't have to get trying to understand it. I just want you to see the diversity of where these people ended up, all right? Gomer, again, Asia Minor. They, uh, they actually, actually, it was Gomerland is what it ended up being called, which became Cumberland. It's like that. those of you that got a decent world map in your head, this is like Northern England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, in that area, that's where they went, all right? So sort of in the European area. Sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog. He, uh, they, they, and I've got here Russians, Slavians, Bulgarians, Poles, ended up in that Russia area. Interestingly, I've never been there and never will go there because I don't think I would ever be on an airplane that long. But I, there's things over across the ocean I'd like to see. And one thing I would love to see is the Wall of China. I've heard about it and I've seen pictures of it. But what I've heard is you cannot possibly imagine what it's like unless you actually physically see it and could stand on it. Have any of you done that? Looking, nobody here? Hmm. So, y'all don't know what it's like either. But interesting that, you know what it used to be called? What it was originally called was the Wall of Magog. That's it. It was China's separation from the people that we're talking about here, the sons of Japheth, Magog, and this Russian group of people. The sons of Magog, another one, was Maidai. These are the Medes. They settled in Persia, in this area, in India, Iran, Afghanistan, the Kurdish people. Like this, this, there's so many stories in here we can't get in too deep to, but why I find this so incredible is, y'all know these two countries don't get along. All right, I think y'all, did y'all know that? That Iraq and Iran, they really don't get along. Did you know that they've really never got along? You know why? You can trace it all the way back to this problem. Uh, Iran is from, what do you think, Japheth, descendants, into what we just looked at with Madai. They settled in where? India, Iran, Afghanistan. Right? That's where they settled. Right? And that's the Kurdish people. You'll hear that. The Farsi, they speak the Farsi language, you know, in Iran. All right? Guess who settled Iraq? The descendants of Shem settled Iraq. And you can trace all the way back the fact that they don't get along because of their descent or their ancestry, where they came from. They've, they've been in turmoil and fighting. Uh, again, their entire existence. Genesis chapter 10, verse 2. Now, we're going to get through chapter 10 and 11, all right, in 15 minutes. Here we go. Sons of Japheth. Another one, Javan. This is the Greek, Romans, eventually the Italians. You can understand that area of the world where they came from. And then Tubal and Meshik. This is, again, another area of Russia. Meshik, eventually, that's the town name Moscow. Tubal is Tobolsk in Russia. So you, you get the idea of Japheth. You, can you sort of see the area of the world where his descendants panned out into? All right. Uh, then Tyrus, this is the father of the Thracians in the Aegean Sea over in that area. Also mentions the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Ripoff. Togomar, I can't say all these names right. This one is really interesting in the son of Gomer, Ashkenaz. Just a little history here. Ashkenaz is the, uh, it's a Jewish, like, 
the, the Ashkenazi is what they're called in the Sephardi. They are different, but they, they have these, they play against each other. The Ashkenazi, they were really in Germany, and then the uh, Sephardi, they were more down in uh, like Italy in that area, but they, they have different cultures, and I tell you that, so they didn't get along. There's so much world history in here that's important. They didn't get along, all right? And I don't know if you ever realize this, but Jews, they spread out, especially in the European area, for many, many years. Up until there was this guy that was a descendant of Japheth. And you remember Japheth and Shem, they don't get along, right? So these are descendants, again, here of Japheth. These are uh, Jewish people that ended up in this area, and you had another descendant of Japheth who didn't like them, and he rose up against them. He was anti-Shem, anti, have you ever heard, anti-Semitic? Y'all hear that name thrown around a lot? This is anti-Shem is where it really came from. This guy was really anti-Shem in 1940, and his name was Adolf Hitler. He was a descendant of Japheth, and he didn't like the Shemites. He didn't like the Jews, and he rose up against them and killed 6,000, right? Guess what happened to the Jewish people? They ended up coming back to Israel, right? And I only mention that because then you had a lot of these Jewish people that had a lot of different cultures and different things that had taken place among them. And when they came back, they really became a much more peaceful people as they were trying to protect themselves from what's taking place in the world. Anyway, let's go on. So, sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish. Any of you remember Tarshish? Who ended up in Tarshish? Huh? Saul of Tarshish. In the uh, Old Testament, who ended up in Tarshish? Jonah, when he was supposed to go where? Nineveh. And he didn't want to go to Nineveh. He didn't like what was going on there, and we'll see why in a minute. And he ended up in Tarsus, right? And you, you just got a, a bunch of other names. So that's the sons of Japheth. I do want to go back and look at this. From these, the maritime people spread out into their territories by their clans with their nations, each with its own language. Important for you to get that, all right? They each had their own language. Now, Sons of Ham, we can't get too deep into this. There are just a couple of things I want to bring out. Sam, uh, the sons of Ham, Cush, this is the area of Egypt, Put, Canaan. They ended up in this Mesopotamia. Y- y- y'all know where the area I'm talking about, Mesopotamia. You know Africa and just to the you know, northern part of Africa, Egypt, and just to the east of that area. That's where these people ended up. The, just one thing that's really interesting to note about this is, go back to Genesis chapter 9, verse 24 and 25. It says, when Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, cursed be Canaan. The lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. <coughs> Who were the sons of Ham? Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The curse was on who? Curse was on who? We just read. Curse is on who? Canaan. When the children of Israel are going to the promised land, who is it that they're to drive out and to destroy? The Canaanites, right? And it's not like God, you know, the curse was Canaan. God was very patient with the Canaanites. He gave them 400 years, all those ites, Jebusites, Amorites, you know, all the ites, the Canaanites. He gave them 400 years to come around. They were a terrible people. They were, again, child sacrifice was one of the biggest things. But God eventually said, and he talks about it, he said, you know, the, the bucket of sin, the bucket of horror among that nation has become full. It's time for them to be driven out. The curse was on Canaan. The curse was on Canaan, and it was to be fulfilled when the children of Israel went into the promised land and destroyed and drove out the Canaanites, right? But guess what? And there's so many things we're going to see as we go through history. Guess what religion helped promote by using Genesis chapter 29, verses 24 and 25. Because guess what people are in this area that we're talking about, Cush and all these others over in Egypt, Africa, what people are there? What we call African American, all right? And during the worst of probably American history, 
And one of the worst times of all of world history was the enslavement of an entire race of people where it was approved and okayed. And guess what? In the name of religion, many people used this very verse and this very curse to say it was okay to enslave an entire group of people because they were saying God had cursed the entire descendants of Ham. When God's curse was on Canaan for a very specific reason in the promised land, but again, religion took this uh, uh, in, in the Mormon church, this hadn't been that recent, you know, several years back, but that recent that actually the descendants of Ham were a cursed people because of this. It's sad what you'll see as we go through time that in the name of religion, we'll take God's word and use it to our benefit for whatever it is we personally or as a race of people or a group of people want to accomplish. We'll take God's word and twist it to make it look like that's okay. And this is part of our, we're going to get to it in just a minute. This is part of what our whole discussion is about today is an understanding of where the diversity of people in our world came from. You get it? Where it all came from. And this is, we're seeing it in all these. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who became a mighty warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That is why it is said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Nimrod was most likely the first king of Babylon, Sargon would have been the other name for Nimrod. This one is talking about a mighty hunter before the Lord. It's not a mighty hunter as in a blessed hunter hunting for God, but a mighty rebel is a better way to say it. He was a mighty rebel before the Lord. Nimrod, he, uh, again, was probably the first leader of Babylon. And he also, uh, we, we go on, here's where it talks about him, where his first sinners were. And from that land, he also, Nimrod, went into Syria where he built Nineveh. And guess what? Nineveh became like one of the major cities in Syria. Nimrod, who is this battle rebel against the Lord. You remember, we're going to get to the point where the children of Israel are in the land. They've got the divided kingdom. Now they've got the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. And remember what happened in 722? Who came in and destroyed the northern kingdom and took them captive? Assyria. This, and guess who this is? Nimrod. Nineveh. The descendants of that. And then in, uh, what was it, 605, I think in 586 B.C., who came in and took the southern kingdom? Babylon, right? The Babylonian. They went into Babylonian captivity. All this back to Nimrod. You see it? The, the history is, it just plays out in front of us. These are the sons of Ham by their clans and languages and their territories and nations. Now we see the sons that were born to Shem, whose older brother was Japheth. Shem was the ancestor of all the sons. This is interesting. All the sons of Eber. Eber... Hebrew, Eber is thought to be the beginning of the Hebrew people, all right? Through Shem, Eber, the sons of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram. Aram, that's interesting. It's uh, Aram, that Syria, where Damascus, and uh, through this uh, of Shem's descendants, they developed in that area their own language, the Aramic language, which is really interesting because Daniel, when he came back from Chaldea out of captivity, Daniel spoke Aramic. What language did Jesus very likely speak? Aramaic. Aramaic. That's where this language came from. I don't know if you knew this. When Mel Gibson did The Passion of the Christ, he had to, or he, he went to the effort to resurrect the Aramaic language so they could use it in that film. It's a dead language, very difficult to do, but they went to a great extent to do that. Uh, again, this is where this came from. The sons of Aram, Uz, who came from Uz? Abraham came from Ur. Job. When Job from us, all these tie together, Hall, Gether, Meshach, we won't go through all these names. These two sons were born to Eber. One was named Peleg because in his time the earth was divided. His brother was named Joktan. 
These are the sons of Shem by their clans, languages, and their territories and their nations. All right, I'm going to skip on over to... All right, you see that there's three sons. A lot of, what, what came through them? I know, you're thinking, you're thinking that, that's all confusing. I don't have any clue what you were talking about, right? I want you to get this from it. I went through all that just so you can get one thing from it. All right, what is it? These people populated the world. All right, Noah came off the boat, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and then through them, and you can trace it to all these nations and these civilizations and these people that came from Shem, Ham, and Japheth. God told them to go fill the world and multiply. But in all that, there was one thing that went wrong. At some point in time, we don't know exactly when it is. We tend to read and think, you know, they got off the boat, is Noah and his three boys, and then like, you know, maybe 10, 15 years later, somebody thought, well, let's build us a, 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 a whatever you, your Bible, let's build us a, <coughs> excuse me, a tower all the way to God, you know. Well, I don't know in that thousand years that's between the flood and Abraham, I'm not sure exactly in there where this played out, all right? But at some point, here's what happened. The whole world had one language and a common speech. When we go through and we see those three sons and we see them divided up, you see they got different languages, right? As they're divided up and they're filling the earth, they're populating the earth, their language, they spoke very different. So at some point in there, the world had one language and a common speech, and as people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinard and settled there. And they said to each other, come, let's make bricks, bake them thoroughly. They used bricks instead of stone for tar and mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So they're going to build this I believe maybe this is the, the, the ziggurats, and we, we will look at a little bit of what was developed and built, but they're, they're, they're building a big building. This would have been some time after the flood because they've developed technology now. They can actually make bricks and mortar, and they can do stuff, all right? But somewhere along the way, and they're all still speaking one language, they had all sort of thought, well, this is better if we're all unified in an effort really against God. We're going to, uh, we're going to put ourselves up as if we're really something. And it's really, this goes all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden. What had happened? Adam and Eve decided, I don't really need God. I'm pretty good on my own. I can make my own decisions about good and evil. Let me do that. Let me figure that out, God. I don't need you to figure that out for me. I'll figure it out for myself. Here's what the people are doing again, all right? They're building a tower. They're saying, hey, wait, God, I, yeah, you got us last time with that flood. You won't get us again. We're united together really against you. And what did God do? It's interesting. They're trying to build this tower up to heaven, and it says God had to do what? He had to come down. So that they're not even close to God. He's still having to come down, right? But he came down to see the city and the tower and the people were building. And the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. That's interesting. So let us, this is the Trinity again, go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel. Interesting, Babel. In Babylonian, this is probably where this was being built, in the Babylonian Empire during that period of time, where they had united together and they're going to build against God. Babel meant gateway to God. In the Hebrew language, guess what Babel means? Confusing. It means confusing. So what this, as man views, is like a gateway to God, what it really is, is you're a confused people. Like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, you thought you would understand as God understands good and evil. No, you just, what you did, you just confused your world. You just confused your life. Now you have these temptations. Now you have these desires that you didn't know were there before, and now they're there, and you don't know what to do with them. You just confused your life. God wanted it simple. You made a mess out of it. Because the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the whole face of the earth. All right, a lot of talking today, so what is our point? I want to make two points. 
And the reason I wanted to spend time there, I know we, and we could, you know, if you're interested in it, and tonight for those that are a small group, we'll spend a little bit more time in chapter 10. There's just so much there, but there, there is so much there. It is really interesting, I think, to look and see how God took Noah, his three sons, and how he made all these nations of the earth. Again, two things for you to think about. He didn't just do it because he was aggravated at them because they were building a tower. He did it for our own good. And you go back to that statement. He said, when they're one, nothing's impossible for them. What, what did, he, did he do that because when we're one, we can't, so we can't do anything? It's... No, it's what he's really saying in that is when they're one, when they come together like that, they just become more and more destructive. That's what they do. And I don't know if you've noticed this. In our world, pay attention to this. In our world, the larger any government gets, all right? And that's, when I say government, what you're really talking about is the larger any human effort gets, the bigger it gets, what happens? The more corrupt it becomes the more evil it is. This is what God did here for us. He said, I'm going to make you a diverse people with a variety of language. I'm trying to help you out. That's what he said. I'm trying to help you out. That's why he came down and confused it, was not to make it difficult for us, but he wanted to help us out. You see, the more we see the diversity that God is and the more we value it, the more to our advantage life becomes. I mean, there's so much power in this that if we as a race of people and a nation of people, ethnic groups could realize is when we value the differences that God put in us, that helps bring out the beauty of His creation. When we try to unite in our efforts, I don't mean like good effort, but you know what I mean? When we try to unite and think that the more we become one in human effort, the better people will be. Y'all hear that? I want you to hear that and I'm going to be done. When we think the more we unite in human effort, the better we'll be, we just don't get it. The more we unite in human effort, the more corrupt that human effort is becomes. Tower of Babel. You get one language, one people, one thought, one mind. We think, well, that'd be wonderful. It will only start down evil paths. The separation, the diversity, the uniqueness, valued and appreciated and lived out is beautiful. That's why in God's church, and all i got to say, that's why in God's church, when God's people are called out, the more that Greg is Greg and Ronnie and Zola are Ronnie and Zola and Alan is Alan, and the more you live out your worship before God, and when I say worship, your service to God, the more you live out in the independent way that God made you and the beauty that God made you, the better we are together. The more we try to put everybody into like a cookie cutter, cookie cutter type of approach to make everybody the same, the more we're doing battle against the beauty that God made. It is wonderful, and we should value and love the diversity that our God gave us in this world. Respect each other. Love each other. You're the way you are because God intended you to be that way. He loves it, and he wants you to love it too. All right, got one more minute, right? I forgot to tell you about this. Where did dinosaurs go? I mean, where'd they go? Well, I'm just going to tell you, they had to die in a flood because they couldn't fit on the ark. Y'all think, well, that's, a, I mean, but here's what's really, what about the pterodactyls? They could have flown around, right? They didn't have to be on the ark. They could have just flown around the whole time. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but after the flood, God gave us a new nation, diverse nation. Took a lot of years to do it, right? But he gave us a new society. He gave us a new government. 
And for those of you that enjoy it, guess what he also gave us? He gave us a new atmosphere. He gave us a new physical presence. Because what was the world like before the flood? Did it rain? No. There was a, like a covering, right? Those are, I'm only throwing this out there for those of you who like to think about this stuff, all right? After the flood, now we had water evaporates and rain comes down. Guess what that changed? Drastically changed, probably cut in half the altimeter. The altimeter, you know what I mean? Atmospheric pressure, that's what altimeter is. Get that? A lot of those animals that could have lived in the old world could have never lived in the new world. Just go look it up. All right? Have a good week. Those of you parents that have small children in class, if you'll go pick them up. And then we encourage everyone to stay and eat lunch with us. Fellowship together. Let's stand and sing as we close. A common love for each other. Common give to the Savior. Common bond holding us to the Yes.